Good morning, Refuge. How you doing? All right. You guys are looking great this morning. We're still this morning? We're still in the morning. Yes, good. Hey, I think that we are going to be blessed as a congregation as we read this one together. I love this text. Uh, in fact, it's one of those that you're probably going to want to keep around all week long with you. So would you stand with me, and I'll read Jeremiah 17.7. Jeremiah 17, 7, and then you guys can read it with me, uh, but I love this one. It gives us a, a, an a awesome truth about who we are in the Lord, and then it gives you a picture. I love pictures, so that it gives us an image as well. So listen to this, and then we'll read it together. But, but blessed is the one who trusts in the Lord, whose confidence is in him. They will be like a tree planted by the water that sends out its roots by the stream. You guys want to read that, don't you? I love it. I love it. Let's read it together. But blessed is the one who trusts in the Lord, whose confidence is in him. They will be like a tree planted by the water that sends out its roots by the stream. And so, Lord, uh, refuges, by the way, filled with these people who in difficult and trying times, they put their trust and their confidence in you. And we ask, Lord, I think all of us are asking, we want to be like those sorts of people that on a continual basis put our trust and confidence, not in man, not in the things of this world, but, Lord, in you. And like that tree, when we do that, Lord, our our, our roots go deep into the stream where you nourish and care for and guide and direct and provide and give us hope. And so, Lord, because we are those people, we want to praise and worship your name this morning. Lord, we think about this text, and that draws us to worship. So, Lord, would you be praised by your people here this morning? Amen. Good morning, Refuge. Shalom, shalom to you. Thank you. We're going to sing an old song. How many of you remember the song, Over the Mountains and the Sea? I can sing of you love forever. All right, we're going to sing that again. We're going to sing a new song. Turn to somebody and say, I'm ready. No, turn to somebody else and say, I'm ready. Over the mountains and the sea, your river runs with love for me. And I will open up my heart, let the healer set me free. I'm happy to be in the truth, and I will daily lift my hands. For I will always sing when your love came down. All right, now you know it. Let's everybody sing it together. Over the mountains and the sea, your river runs with love for me. And I will open up my heart and let the healer set me free. I'm happy to be in the truth, and I will daily lift my hand. For I will always sing of when your love came down. I could sing of your love forever. I could sing of your love. runs with love for me and I will open up my heart and let the healer set me free I'm happy to be in the truth and I will daily lift my hand for I will always sing when your love came down I could sing of your love forever I could sing of your love sing I will sing of your love and I will sing of your love forever. I will sing of your love forever. And oh, I feel like dancing. And it's foolishness, I know. But when the world has seen the light, they will dance with joy in your presence, Lord. Sing of your love forever. I could sing of your love forever. I could sing of your love forever. I could sing of your love forever. Remember when we first 
started singing this song at Refuge, and the last line was a little bit different. He said, uh, when the world has seen the light, they will dance with, with joy like we're dancing now. And we were dancing like this. We were standing straight up. So you feel like you got to move a little bit. You're more than welcome to do that. But I'll tell you, when we stand in the presence of the Lord, when we get off our faces after the first thousand years, I think we're going to be doing some uh, Holy Spirit-inspired dancing. Anybody believe that? All right, let's sing again. Over the mountains and the sea, your river runs with love for me. And I will open up my heart and let the healer set me free. I'm happy to be in the truth. And I will daily lift my hand, for I will always sing of when your love came down. And I will sing of your love forever. I will sing of your love of your love forever our voices now and I will sing of your love forever I will sing of your love forever I will sing of your love forever I will sing of your love forever
my life you have been so so good with every breath that I Goodness is running after, it's running after me. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. With my life laid down, I'm surrendered now. I give you everything. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. my life you have been faith. Sing that out strong if it's true. And all my life you have been so, so good. With every breath that I am able, oh, I will sing of the goodness of God. All my life you have been faithful. Yes, you have. And all my life you have been so, so good. With every breath that I am able, I will sing of the goodness of God. Here's the, here's the new song I promised you. You don't mind standing a little longer. You're going to sit for a long time today. <laughs> Peter Warren is preaching this morning. You're going to sit for... No, I'm just kidding. I'm kidding, Peter. <laughs> I heard this song while I was walking on the beach um, probably a little over a year ago. And uh, you ever had a song that just grabbed you and it held you and all you could listen to for a day or two was that song? This was that song. And it's a prayer where we're saying to God, let me be filled with kindness and compassion for the one, the one that you love, the one that you love so much and, and gave your son. And, um, and it has this one line in it that just says, increase my love. And um, I really believe that that is one of the keys in revival, in an awakening in a region or a revival in a church, is when all the people that are looking this way on Sunday morning go out those doors and start looking around for the next person that's in the middle of their road that they get to love on and they get to share Jesus with. And you may not be the one that prays the prayer with them, but your touch on their life will be, it'll be redemptive. Joy and I got stuck in uh, San Fran crazy, I mean San Francisco <laughs> overnight. And, and Joy was quicker to realize, well, maybe God, this is not an accident. Maybe God has us here for something. I'm like, okay, all right. <laughs> I'm the pastor. I'll tell you when I'm going to be happy. But, <laughs> but uh, she was right. And uh, two um, Lyft drivers. One was a man who was from Palestine. He's uh, Palestinian from, from Israel, actually from Jerusalem. And so I used every Arabic word that I knew on him. Three of them. <laughs> One of them was just uh, salam. You know, it's, it's a way of saying hello, like a shalom. And the, the other one, when we were getting ready to leave his car, was shukran, which is thank you. And afwan, he said back to me, which is you're welcome. But um, just got to speak of the Lord to him and tell him why we were there. And then the last guy, it was, it was amazing, on the way back to the airport, he, uh, he and I just got in a great conversation, a real happy guy, and told him why we were there. And I'm a pastor, and I was up in Montana, and we got stuck here, and I was doing a, a men's retreat, you know, sort of slipping in, hey, I'm an agent of the kingdom of God, sort of thing. But um, as we were leaving, I didn't get to pray the prayer with him, but I, I, the Lord just made it so clear to, to say this to him. 
and I, I was just a little bit nervous about it, but, uh, but eventually, as the last bag was coming out of his uh, trunk of his car, I, I said, Aiden, I just really know that, that Jesus brought us here so that I could tell you he loves you. He loves you, and he just kind of, it's like nobody had ever said that to him before, but that may be you out there. So look for the one. Here's a song. Let me be filled with kindness and compassion for the one. The one for whom you love and gave your son for humanity. Increase my love. Sing that with me. Let me be filled. Let me be filled with kindness and compassion for the one. The one for whom you love and gave your son for humanity. Increase my love. Help me to love with open arms like you do. A love that erases all the lines and sees the truth. And oh, that when they look in my eyes, they would see you. Even in just a smile, they would feel the Father's love. Oh, how you love us From the homeless To the famous And in between You formed us And you made us carefully Cause in the end Oh, we're all your children Help me to love And help me to love With open arms like you do a love that erases all the lies and sees the truth and all oh, that when they look in my eyes they would see you even in just a smile they would feel the father's love let all my life tell of who you are And the wonders of your never-ending love Oh, let all my life tell of who you are That you're wonderful and such a good father let all my life tell of who you are And the wonder of your never-ending love Oh, let all my life tell of who you are That you're wonderful, such a good father So help me to love Help me to love with open arms like you do A love that erases all the lines and sees the truth Oh, that when they look in my eyes, they would see you Even in just a smile, they would feel the Father's love even in just a smile, they would feel the Father's love. Because you are worthy of it all. You are worthy of it all. For from you are all things. And to you are all things, and you deserve the glory. How many of you believe that? See, worthy of it all. Let's lift our hands and tell him that you are worthy. Oh, you are worthy of it all. You are worthy.
know your Bible, you've read that passage in the book of Revelation when we appear in heaven. We're going to see angels and elders and us on our faces before him because he is worthy. It's a scene I can't wait to be a part of just on my face before him for maybe a thousand heavenly years or however long that takes and then to stand up and to look into the face of the one who bore my, my sorrows and my sins to look at his hands and to see the wounds and realize that's him that's him and we'll sing Lord you are worthy of it all let's sing it again all the saints and let's lift our hands as we do it all the saints. Oh, all the saints and angels, we bow before your throne. And all the elders cast their crowns before the Lamb of God and sing. You are worthy of it all. You are worthy of it all. For from you are all things, and to you are all things. You deserve the glory. For from you are all things, and to you are all things you deserve glory oh Lord you do Lord how could we give you anything less than all of us and everything that you've given to us Lord all that we are Lord, our heart our mind our soul our strength our will and all the stuff you've given us Lord it's all yours it's all from you and it's all because of you so, Lord, would you move in this place today? And, Lord, would you revive those of us that need to be revived? And would you save those today, Lord, that need to step out of the darkness and come into your family? And we just ask, Lord, for just the anointing of your spirit to rest upon your church, Lord, as we gather. And all over this county, Lord, as churches are gathering right now, Lord, would you, would you fall upon them, Lord, by your spirit? Would you refresh and renew? Have your way in Jesus' name. In the name of the Amen. Amen. And Shaddy's going to come up and talk to us about some important stuff. Do yeah. you love this guy? Yeah. Love this that, that was really powerful, you guys. Thank you guys so, so much. I don't know how I'm supposed to do announcements after all that, but we're going to try. Uh, baptisms. We have baptisms next week. Um, if you haven't been baptized, why not? Let's, let's do it. Let's get baptized. There's going to be a meeting uh, today right after the service at 1 o'clock, and we're going to talk about the importance of baptism, and we're going we're gonna to write out your, uh, your testimony so that next week, when, uh, when you're getting wet, uh, we could be up here and we could be uh, sharing all the cool things that, that God has done. So it's, it's just a way to stand up and to brag uh, just about how great your God is. So if you haven't been baptized, please do so. The men are having a breakfast coming up as well, March 11th. Uh, it's at 8 in the morning. It's only $5. And for $5, you get to fellowship with other brothers uh, you get uh, you get a great word from David Zamora. Do you guys know David Zamora? Okay, and you get a really big burrito. You, you, the breakfast burrito, that's my man right there. No, I know you were clapping for David Zamora. Yeah. Okay, we also got a movie night that is in the books. It's coming up, I believe it's this Friday, March 10th. And uh, is it this Friday? No, next Friday. Anyways, it's March 10th. You guys could check out and find out which, which Friday it is. It is this Friday. Thank you very much. So the, the, the movie is uh, very, uh, it's gospel-centered. So invite a friend, hopefully, who's never heard the gospel before, and um, I guarantee you they will hear the gospel that night. So uh, come, invite a friend. It's free to get in. There's going to be a little love offering afterwards uh, so that we could support the ministry of the producer, uh, Rich Cristiano. Uh, this is the gentleman that did uh, other Christian movies that, 
that were very, very good as well. So the story of Jose is one of my favorites. Family hiking day is this Saturday. Usually we get 40 to 50 people. This looks like it's going to be a short one. It's only three miles, but I don't think it's, uh, it, it might not be too hard. So it's hard. It's hard. It's hard. Don't come. Just, just don't come. Don't, it's, see, I lie to them so they could come, but if you want to tell them the truth. So yeah, I guess it's a little bit hard. So um, Greg and Christina Haynes are the people to talk to. They could tell you exactly um, how hard it's going to be. Their email is on the flyers. Uh, you could find them online or at the info counter. And please sign up as well so that uh, we could all go together. So we don't, we don't forget anybody. And finally, um, do you guys remember uh, Jonathan Trask? He was a pastor here for a long time, and then last year the Lord led him back home, back up the mountain. Uh, so he's in Big Bear, in that Big Bear area right now, and as you know, they are completely um, shut down. There's snow everywhere. Um, he's just taken it as, as this ministry of uh, the Lord's given them a verse to love thy neighbor. So that's what they've been doing. They've been shoveling driveways and, and bringing food to people that, that can't hike uh, to get food for themselves. And he reached out and he said, hey, if, if the church wants to participate, um, there's a lot of people in need. So we, we, we got a jar, a donation jar. It's over at the book the bookstore. Um, all right, bookstore? Bookstore. Yeah, it's at the bookstore. So um, you, just a couple of bucks, whatever you guys have. Um, it, your change is, is great. Um, and uh, we will make sure that, that we get that money to them. So that is all I have for you guys. If you guys want to stand up and greet each other, and remember, you could always find more information online. I never cried before I met you guys. I don't know what that's all about, but <laughs> um, uh, how many of you remember Peter Warren? He's been among us a bunch of times, and, and he's with us today. And uh, I had asked Peter if he would, would come and share this weekend, and uh, I asked him the other day, so what are you going to be sharing about? And he told me, and it's, uh, it, it's a great message that um, I think you shared with the couples, when, when he and Linda were doing the couples retreat. And it was really great. And I thought, well, I'm, I'm excited about hearing that again. But then I thought about where we are right now as a church and um, what has been on everybody's mind uh, over the last at least couple weeks, couple, maybe a couple months, and maybe long, long, long before that is revival and awakening. Revival in the church, awakening in our land and seeing lost people come to Jesus Christ and wanting to be a part of that. And there isn't anybody I personally know that is more involved all over the world than Peter and Linda Warren with Youth with a Mission for 40-something years, right? Planted the base up in Denver, uh, one of the most fruitful bases ever. And, um, and, and who has seen, you know, God move in different cultures and in um, different locations. And so I, I called him. Uh, a couple of days after he told me what he was going to speak on, he's got a different story about what I said, but um, my story is accurate. Um, no, no, I'm kidding. I know what I said. I have no idea what you heard. But um, yeah, I know, I know. This is dangerous for me to do this because he's going to clean up the mess that I make. But um, I said, you know, that, and that would be fine to, to, to go ahead and share that. It's a, it's, it was a powerful message. But could you bring us something to out of your experience about what you've seen God doing around the world and what he's studied, studied, has studied for years about revival and evangelism and, and what God is, is doing in different parts of the planet. And uh, so I asked him that and I got a text back and, and it, was, it was really, it was, it was gracious. And, um, 
And uh, so I've heard this three times already. And you, I'm, see where I'm sitting? I'm in here for number four because I want to hear this again. And it's something of it is really seeping down to where it belongs in my heart. Another thing I wanted to say, and this is the last thing, is when you hear me say that, um, um, pray for me, I'm going to be gone. And I put this up on social media as well. Hey, pray for me as I, as I go and get together with a bunch of pastors for another Storm Brothers. You hear me talk about the Storm Brothers? This is the original Storm Brother. In, in, in this, uh, this ministry that God has led us to, to put together. There's a lot of storm brothers and sisters in my life too. And, and we all have those people that strengthen us. But um, he was out here speaking almost two years ago right now. And when he, um, we, I think it was a Saturday before he spoke, we were having lunch down at uh, Sunset Beach at a taco place. And uh, I said, anything you got to do before you go back, you need to pick up anything. He said, I need to walk on your beach. And so we went and walked on, um, on the beach and, and just shared with one another. And on the way back to, to my truck, uh, we paused on the beach. And I, I said, I just want to share something with you. I want, I want to ask you for prayer over this, this thing going on in, in my head and my heart. And, and, um, and so he shared with me as well. And we just prayed for one another. And that was the beginning of Storm Brothers of gathering together a small group of, uh, of either senior pastors or primary leaders of ministries and just being together for three days to bear each other's burdens and speak into one another's life. So this is Storm Brother Peter Warren. Would you welcome him, please? And he's in the process of writing a book on prayer. But that's not done yet, but he brought us two books, When the Shooting Stopped and The Dreamer. And I haven't read The Dreamer yet, but the, uh, When the Shooting Stopped talks about that tragedy that the YWAM base went through about 15 years ago when a gunman came in, a former YWAMer that just had some psychological problems, opened fire, and uh, two kids were killed and two others were wounded. And then the next day he had escaped, and the next day he went down to... Uh, Colorado Springs and open fire in a church there and he was taken down but uh, it's not just about that event it's a it answers the question where is God when we suffer and when tough things happen and then the dreamer is about discovering what God puts you here to do and here's Peter love you man love you too bro <laughs> thank you what's that oh fantastic Say it louder. What did you say? Yeah. <clears throat> and then we started doing one for couples, for, for senior leaders and their spouses. And uh, with Bill and Joy together and my wife Linda and me, and we called it Kara uh, when, uh, when John the Baptist was beheaded. Jesus said to the disciples, come away and rest a while. So we, we call it Kara, and we've been doing those as well, and uh, have grown to love you, Joy, and appreciate your, your investment in, in Linda's and my life as well. Now, in the, in the interest of complete honesty and clarity, Why is this not going? <laughs> I'm going to get it. I'm going to get it here. Uh, okay, so. Oh, I know. There, there. Reminding him that you're coming, and we're excited about that. And um, I think we were both wondering. This is um, Jeff. Jeff. And if you feel real firm about sharing on that, that message about the disappointments and that, that's, that's great. But um, whether you can somehow work into that, um, maybe something about uh, about revival and the move of the Holy Spirit. Okay, so when when the, the the pastors call you and say, you know, Jeff and I have been talking and praying, and could you weave in something about revival? That means talk about revival. Okay, <laughs> right? You understand what that means? So so I understood very clearly. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Um, God's kingdom is built on relationships, isn't it? And God is a relational God. He created us 
for a relationship. That's why he made us in his image. Because when the Bible says God made us in his likeness, Genesis 1.26, we're not that much like God, right? We're not omnipotent or omnipresent. We don't know everything. We're not omniscient. We're not eternal in our nature. So what does it mean? Well, he made us in his image and personality with minds, emotions, and a will. We have personalities made in the image of God so we can have a relationship with him and one another. And God's desire is that people would come to know him intimately and have this relationship. And he gives us the privilege of being in relationship with one another. And that's what the body of Christ is. And so yeah, I'm so grateful for you guys, Linda and I are. And Okay, so but that's not what I'm going to talk about. Because I have uh, a mandate here to speak on certain things. And I am grateful for it because as I... So three days ago, I get this message. I'm flying in from London, arrive in Washington, D.C. on my way to Georgia, to Atlanta, and I get this message. So I'm beginning to prepare all this stuff. So I've got all this, and I'm ready to go. So you ready to listen? Okay. Not my idea. Started with him. So I'll start with a question. Is it possible? Is it possible that we in this country are on the verge of seeing another outpouring of God's spirit? Because God has a habit of doing that in dark times. And the last time he did it was 50 years ago. And it started right here. And then it spread. And God has done things like this at key times in the history of this world. And we read through the Bible where God then would show up in people's lives. And we've called this revival when God revives us when we have maybe grown cold and God revives us again. And he's talked about this in advance, usually through prophets. The greatest example of this was Jesus coming to the earth and when the fullness of time had come, he sent his son. There was something about the timing of God. And there were several hundred prophecies that were fulfilled when, when Jesus came. And I have a feeling that we're on the verge of seeing God do something again. Because we're coming up on a very key time. In 10 years, what year will it be in 10 years? To, 2000th anniversary of the resurrection. Yeah, yeah, he died. But the resurrection, okay, when Jesus was brought back to life and the birth of the church. And could it be that we're gearing up for something that is significant? I, I have a feeling that we are. And, um, and the last great awakening was here 50 years ago-ish, give or take a few years. And at that time, there were 210 million people in America. And there are 331 million now, 121 million. That's a difference of 121 million people who didn't experience what God did. And there were no Gen Zs. There were no millennials. Only half of the Gen Xs were born. Okay? The other half were seven years or younger. And, and God, it seems like, is going to do something again. And so when I got this message from... Bill very graciously saying, you can talk on whatever you want. But Jeff and I were thinking, then, okay, then I began scrambling and preparing. And I thought, you know what, I'm going to go, I'm not going to throw you under the bus anymore, okay, if you have my word. So um, I felt like, let's look back, because there are certain things that give us perspective, and looking back is one of those things. We need to know where we've come from to know where we're going. We need to have a perspective to see ahead. And so what are some of the great revivals of history? What, what, is, what are things that God has done? Because although he doesn't like to be put in a box, and whenever he is, he does something completely different, but there are certain habits, I guess you could say, that God has had in doing things a certain way. And so let's talk about that. So first of all, what is revival? Well, the word revival doesn't actually appear in the Bible. The closest thing we have is, is this word revive. David said, 
will you not revive us again that your people may rejoice in you? So revival brings great joy in our lives. But the point that stands out here is that it's not about us doing something to make it happen, except having hearts that are prepared, but it starts with God, doesn't it? Will you not revive us again? It's about him. This is important. It's definitely not evangelism. It's not signs and wonders. It's not the baptism of the Holy Spirit. It's definitely not, I mean, it includes some of those things, but it's definitely not a series of meetings. You go to the South, they have revivals many times, but there was a guy from England I heard about who was driving through the south, and he, out of the corner of his eye, he saw this big sign, revival. And in England, that meant something different. It wasn't just a series of meetings, and he slammed on the brakes, did a U-turn, drove into this parking lot of this big church, and, and came in through the foyer. The front door was unlocked, and, and, and it, it was empty. And there was a janitor up front doing the vacuuming, and he yelled out, hey, where's the revival? And the guy turned the the vacuum off, and he said, what? The revival. And he said, there's a sign out front that says revival. And he said, oh, oh, that starts uh, Sunday night at 7.30. That's not revival. <laughs> That's a meeting. Charles Finney, who lived in the 1800s in western New York, and this was called the Second Great Awakening. We've had three great awakenings on the earth, and the second great awakening happened up in Rochester, New York. About two million people came to Christ. Charles Finney said, and I love that song, Bill, that you, you taught us this morning. It's the renewal of the first love of Christians. Because that's what it's all about. It's about relationship with them, right? Resulting in the awakening and conversion of sinners to God, it's the arousing, quickening, and reclaiming of the more or less backslidden church and the general awakening of all classes of society. It, it leads into revival is in the church, but it breaks outside the four walls of the church and becomes spiritual awakening and then the reformation of a whole culture. That's how it happens. Winky Prattney from New Zealand, who probably has written more about revival than anyone else I know. He has a whole library on revival in Texas. And he says this. I love this definition. Revival is God divinely intervening in the church. Hey, bro. Good to see you, Mike. Uh, in awful holiness, in such a manifest sense that human personalities are overshadowed. It's difficult for those personalities. Human programs are abandoned. It's very difficult for those who are control freaks. And man takes the back seat because God is driving the tank. <laughs> Author and Bible teacher Joy Dawson says, Revival is God doing in seconds what man has been trying to do for years. So here are some of the, the patterns that I noticed as I was given the role of prepare to speak on revival. And I began researching and looking at this and compiling what I'm sharing with you today. Historically, revival has happened sovereignly. Psalm 110 verse 3 says, in the day of your power. I want you to think about that. Isn't God powerful every day? He is. So what is David talking about? Well, God is powerful every day, but there are times when he invades our human realm and reveals his power. Isaiah, the prophet, said it like this. Would you rend the heavens and come down? And God shows up. And you know what happens? The, the enemy flees. And the veil that he's put over people's eyes, because it's not just about witnessing, because people are blinded. They're not totally blinded. They see a little bit, but it's confusing because one of the names of the devil is the God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers. And the veil is lifted and people, thousands, sometimes by the millions, like what happened in Rochester, New York, come to Christ because the veil is lifted. It's got to result in people coming to Christ. A.W. Tozer said, if it doesn't impact the surrounding community, it's probably not revival. Another characteristic is it happens untraditionally. 
And because of this, it makes the traditionalists really uncomfortable. Long hours of worship and prayer, sometimes through the night, sometimes like what's happening in, in several university campuses right now that started in Asbury, Kentucky, for days on end, 24-7, sometimes for weeks, months, sometimes it's recorded that it happened for years. The longest unbroken prayer chain that I read about, you know how many years it lasted? 100 years. It was about 500 years ago. There was this guy from eastern Germany on the Polish border called Count Nicholas, Count Nicholas Ludwig von Zinzendorf. How come the Germans get all the good names, you know? <laughs> well, Zinzendorf, we'll just call him Zinzendorf, was going through, he's a wealthy man, he's got all this estate over there. I've been actually to the place where this happened in, uh, in Germany and been to the cemetery where he's buried. But Zinzendorf is traveling through Europe, and he's in this art gallery, and there's a painting of Jesus on the cross, and he is just impacted by this. And God begins to speak to him about his love for him and the cross, and he's just looking at it, and then he notices there's an inscription below it, and he gets closer, and the inscription says, all this I did for you, what are you doing for me? And he said to the Lord, Lord, I want to be a willing vessel. If you'll just use me, you can have everything I have, everything I am, just use me. So he leaves, gets back to his estate, and there are all these people camping out. It sort of looked like some of these places in California and Oregon and Washington with all these homeless people. It was like an encampment of these refugees that had been fleeing from persecution by the Catholic Church in what was called Bohemia and Moravia. If you've heard of the Moravians, you've heard of the Moravian brethren? Okay, this is the beginning of the Moravians. They were fleeing, and they found this open area, and it was Zinzendorf's place. And God spoke to him and said, this is what I, you said you'd be willing? Okay, here it is. Start a community. So they started a community, and they started a prayer meeting that lasted 24-7 for 100 years, unbroken, Wow, they sent out missionaries all around the world. <laughs> Untraditionally, not the, not the normal thing. Signs and wonders happen, even if you don't believe in them. It's shocking. It's shocking. So I was, I was in this, this meeting. This is back in the 70s, okay? And my wife and I had a youth group, and we took them to this large gathering with this preacher, it wasn't Lonnie Frisbee, it was another guy similar to that, okay? And in the middle of his message, he started getting words of knowledge for people. And we had a girl in our group who had cirrhosis of the liver. She'd been an alcoholic. She came to Christ, but she still had this. And this guy pointed her out and he said, you over there, you have cirrhosis of the liver. And she stood up and God healed her and she fell back like fainting. And, and this is somewhat humorous, okay? I mean, this, this really happened. There's this guy that had walked in, an unsaved guy who had a bad back and shoulder, and he was just checking it out, and he was sitting right behind Kathy, and when she stood up and fell, he reached out to keep her from falling, and the power of God went through her as well and healed his back and his neck, and five minutes later, he's up the front at the altar on his knees giving his life to Christ. Oh, wow. That's the type of thing. But it's messy. <laughs> and this part is not the fun part, but one of the other characteristics is that God brings conviction of sin. And as we repent for sin, it cleanses us and it opens us to him, for him to use us as vessels. James Burns who lived at the turn of the last century, 1909, said this, Revival be begins with humiliation, a bitter knowledge of unworthiness, and an open and humiliating confession of sin on the part of the ministers and the people. It comes to scorch before it heals. It comes to convict ministers and people alike for their unfaithful witness, for their selfish living, and for their neglect of the cross. Charles Finney, speaking at the village schoolhouse in Antwerp, New York, said, an awful solemnity 
settled on the people. Then the congregation began falling from their seats in every direction and crying out for mercy. If I had a sword in my hand, I couldn't have cut them down as fast as they fell. And then he said, I was obliged to stop preaching. <laughs> Good thing. Because God was moving. It was like, out of the way, Finney. I'm going to do something. I don't know why this is, but it usually starts in one location. Probably where there's a group of people, like what we're witnessing in Asbury and other places, where, where a group of people have said, Lord, come and do your work. And then it spreads from there. But we even use geographical terms. The Azusa Street Revival, which started with a guy called William Seymour. And the second great awakening in western New York where the jails were empty and no one was going to the bars. Bartenders were out of business. It was terrible. It was great. <laughs> Two million people came to Christ. Here's, here's one of the quotes I read of circuit writers who came back and reported, we could not, quote, we could not find one unsaved person in all the surrounding villages. <laughs> wow. How incredible. And then there's the Welsh revival, not related to Bill at all, but the Welsh revival that happened in Wales, they called it the fire zone. The, the, the Welsh revival started in the north and south of Wales on the same day in, I think it was 1904. And the preacher was not a great preacher. That's just my perspective, but... It was praise and worship. The key to the Welsh revival was praise and worship. Evan Roberts was the, one, the main guy. and It wasn't him, but, but the worship and then God just would move. But it was within a defined geographical boundary. I don't know why that is. But the same thing happened here. It started in this area of Southern California and happened here for a while. And then just, well, actually it started in San Francisco, right? Then came down, but it really took off when it got here. The fire zone, people would walk into the fire zone and there's one guy who just dropped all his money he'd made that day because the presence of God was so strong. And, and I read about ships coming into the fire zone. The fire zone would, would reach 30 miles out to sea and ships would arrive and, and all of the sailors had repented and arrived at port rejoicing. Ship after ship after ship. I mean, God rend the heavens and came down. Oh, I long for that. Don't, don't you want to see that again? Oh, that's what we need because our methods and our programs are not intrinsically wrong, but there's something at another level when God pours out his spirit like this. Oh, do it again, Lord. Not only does God do unusual things, he uses unusual people. So there's hope for us. Look around the room. That, that was a joke, by the way. Who will God use? Well, here we have. He uses the weak and the foolish. Oh, praise God for that. We qualify for God to use us. You see it in the Bible. You see Elijah and Jeremiah and John the Baptist who lived on honey and locusts out in the wilderness. I can just picture someone going up to talk to him about being baptized and, and, and there's, you know, oh, you have a grasshopper leg there on your beard, you know? And, uh, and, and <laughs> can you just picture that? And, and Peter and John, I didn't put the scripture up, but Acts 4.13 says, the religious leaders uh, saw that Peter and John were uneducated and untrained and they were marveling. And then, then here it says, and then they began to remember seeing them as being with Jesus. Ah, oh, that, that's what makes the difference. And then we have some current examples of these unlikely heroes. Have you ever seen video footage of Catherine Coleman? Catherine Coleman, who even when she was like 75, looked like she was 16. And this little lady would come out and just talk in this little voice, but she had this spiritual bazooka. And, and one time, she motioned to the choir. She shouldn't have done that. The whole choir fell down, slain in the spirit. It's like, uh-oh, what are we going to do for worship now? And, um, <laughs> and God would use people like this. Another guy was called William Branham 
who God would give him a vision when God was going to show up and do miracles, he'd see the angel of the Lord at the back of the meeting hall. And so he'd come, he'd come out, it'd be 7.05, the meeting's supposed to start at 7, and he'd go, oh, I can't do anything. <laughs> and then 7.10, sorry, folks, he's not here yet. I can't do anything. And then, then he'd go, oh, he's here. Okay. And then he'd start preaching and praying for people. And God would really do stuff. I mean, New Testament level stuff. William Branham, unusual guy. The Azusa Street Revival. Not, it was William Seymour. William Seymour, one-eyed preacher who would stick his head inside the pulpit every time he prayed. That was his conviction. He had a personal conviction. That, that's not necessarily the way you have to do things. But for him, that was his obedience to the Holy Spirit. And he'd stick his head. Dear Father, we thank you today. That's what he would do. And the Azusa Street Revival happened. And then there was a guy... This guy, just by his name, you knew he was very unique. His name was Smith Wigglesworth. You ever heard of Smith Wigglesworth? Okay, Smith Wigglesworth. Let me tell you what, one of the stories. He's walking down the streets of Geneva, Switzerland, with his eyes closed, praying out loud in the spirit. He must have been peeking so he didn't run into a wall or something, but... This was the report. And the Swiss guy stops him and says, excuse me, but what are you doing? And Smith, a normal response would be, oh, hi, my name's Smith. Nice to meet you. Smith goes, put out your tongue. The guy figures he doesn't have anything to lose, so he puts out his tongue. Smith grabs his tongue and prophesies over him and says, this tongue is going to preach to multitudes. Listen, I'm not making this stuff up, okay? <laughs> you can't make this up. This tongue will preach to multitudes. And then lets his tongue go and heads off down the street with his eyes closed, praying out loud. <laughs> and this Swiss guy is sufficiently interested at this point to follow him. Follows him into the back of this meeting hall where Smith Wigglesworth is having a crusade. And that night gets saved, gets a call to the ministry, ends up preaching to multitudes. Wow. God uses unusual people. If you saw the movie, Lonnie Frisbee was not a normal guy. Okay? God uses vessels of many kinds and fills them. And one other characteristic. It's not every time, but many times. More often than not, revival was, it came during spiritually, morally dark times and then there was some kind of a crisis that God used for people to pray and to return to him. J. Edwin Orr, who preached for Bill years ago out in the desert, talking about the 1857 revival. That's not when he actually was with Bill. Talk, talking about the, the, the revival in the 19th century, he said this. Gambling was prevalent, involvement in the occult had become popular, immorality was commonplace, there was commercial and political corruption, many people had become atheists, and then there was an economic crash. The whole system fell apart. Back then, this was the system. Banks failed, railroads went into bankruptcy, factories shut down, people lost their jobs, and people started crying out to God, and he poured out his spirit in 1857. <laughs> Someone might say, but aren't we kind of a little too far gone? No, the word of God is the same. God says, even when he speaks concerning a nation and a king kingdom, to pluck it up, pull it down. I love this word, that two-letter word. If, if that nation against whom I've spoken turns from its evil, I will relent. The word relent means change my mind of the disaster that I thought to bring upon it. So... Here's a little history lesson. Where are we at now in 2023? Where are we headed? What is God doing? I can, I can sense a rumbling, can't you? Can't you sense just in the spirit realm like there's something that God is about to do? Um, and I don't know 
if this is the last great revival, but if we're living in the last days, then we're going to see a Joel 2 type revival. There's never been worldwide revival. But prior to the end, the Bible tells us that God's going to pour out his spirit on all flesh. That's worldwide revival. Can you imagine if billions of people, there are 8 billion people on earth, billions of people, including the Muslim world and other places, just would have come to Christ because the veil is lifted? Can you imagine that? Would that be on the heart of God? Is that something that he would want to do? Oh, absolutely, 100%. And it results in spiritual awakening because he says, whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Someone who knows the Bible might say, but wait a minute, Peter. Joel chapter 2 was talking about Pentecost because in Acts, Simon Peter got up and he said, this is what the prophet Joel was talking about. And he quotes Joel. So it was Pentecost. It's not the end times. However, when you go back to Joel chapter 2, it's clearly talking about stuff that didn't happen back at Pentecost. It was beyond that. It's talking about the end times. So how could Peter say that? Well, what happened at Pentecost was incredible, but the same thing is going to happen at the end of the time, but maybe even more. And James, Jesus' half-brother, James' half-brother, because... Jesus' father was God, but he, he gave an explanation. Therefore, be patient, brethren, he said, until the coming of the Lord. See how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth, waiting patiently for it until it receives the early and the latter rain. The early rain was an outpouring, and then in the springtime, there was the latter rain. And so what happened back in Acts chapter 2, happening again, but in a greater way. So, what's our part? Well, there's no method. Because as soon as you organize it, it's over. You have to let God have his way. You just have to do what Bill and Joy did the other day, coming back from Montana. Their plane was diverted to San Francisco. So they witnessed to the Uber drivers each way about the Lord. Okay, I was talking with one guy last night. What was his name? He was... He's down at Huntington Beach Pier, preaching on the streets. He said five people came to the Lord the night before. Some of them were just listening in to him sharing the gospel. And then this morning, I went down to Starbucks at 5.30 and got my venti americano with extra steamed heavy cream. And on my way back, I startled this guy who was sitting at the bus stop. And, you know, the, you, you can't see someone walking on the footpath. And then I came up and he jumped. And the Holy Spirit said, share the gospel with him. So I said, hey, I'm a pastor. Can I pray for you as a, you know, and I shared a little bit. What do you need prayer for? And he said, pray that the bus would come quickly. It's like, okay. <laughs> I was expecting something a little deeper than that. But, but then I prayed for that. But then I prayed for him that he'd come to know the Lord. And I prayed for his family. And, and there's, no, there's no specific way. It's just God, just open the doors. Just step out. And D.L. Moody, have you ever heard of D.L. Moody, Dwight Moody? Uh, he would witness. And whenever you step out and obey the Lord, people are going to criticize you. And some guy was very critical of Moody and said, well, I don't like your methods of witnessing. And Moody said, okay, well, I'm willing to learn. Tell me how you do it. And the guy was taken back and he said, well, that's not my ministry. And <laughs> Moody said, well... I like my way of doing it better than your way of not doing it. There's, there's not just one way. You just step out, look for open doors. I love the way Bill put it. You know, How did you say it to the Uber driver? I think, yeah. Yeah, I think maybe Jesus just sent me here to be in your Uber car here to tell you that he loves you. Just that. Oh, see, because... We don't need to harvest the crop until it's ready to be harvested. But there's the planting, there's the watering, there's just that little part. Maybe you just say that. That guy, someone else is going to come along and someone else. And, and uh, so God just wants us to be willing. So let me, let me close with this story of one of my favorite unlikely heroes. She lived 100 years ago. 
Uh, her name was Gladys. Gladys Elwood. You ever heard of Gladys Elwood? No. <laughs> she didn't have a rock band or country music band or anything. She was a maid in England, in London, a chambermaid. That, and God burdened her heart for China. And this is in the 19, early 1930s, late 1920s. And she said, God, I need to go to China. So she went to the main missions organization started by, by a guy called Hudson Taylor called the China Inland Mission. She applied to go as a missionary. They got back to her. Have you ever gone for a job interview and they came back and said, well, thank you for applying, but no thanks. Okay, that's what they said to her. Uh, you, you're not educated enough. And anyway, they gave her all these reasons. They underestimated who she was. She was the small woman. A movie was made of her called, called The Inn of the Sixth Happiness. And because uh, that's the inn she started at, in China. So she, she went, fine, I'm going anyway. She didn't know how far China was. She gets on a, she's got a map. She goes across the English Channel. She gets on these trains. She's in the middle of Russia and she didn't know China and Russia at that time were on this undeclared war with each other. And there are bombs going off. And soldiers get on the train and they say, everyone get off. And she said, I'm not getting off. I'm not getting off in her English accent. Get off. No. And she's holding on to this railing. No. So the captain says, just leave her on the train. So they leave her on the train. And they go another five miles or so into the middle of this war zone. And all the soldiers get off and she's left on this dark train and she has to walk back to the place they told her to get off at and catches another train. She couldn't get into China, so she had to go across to Japan and back and entered this town called Young Cheng. And in Young Cheng, she became the local foot inspector because many of the women, for a thousand years, Chinese women had their feet wrapped so they'd walk in a certain way. It was, one of, it was a torturous, horrible practice and they had gangrene and she would inspect their feet, and she shared the gospel and began to lead people to Christ. And in 1938, the Japanese bombed Yang Cheng uh, as the outset of World War II in the Pacific and Asia, and all these kids were left parentless, and they were orphaned, and she began to take them in. She took in one, two, five, ten. 15, 20, eventually close to 100 kids between ages of 4 to 14. And then the Japanese were, were starting to close in. And so she led them uh, to trek through valleys and mountains. Incredible story. Okay? The most unlikely hero. And finally, her heroics came to an end, at least in her own mind, when they got to the Yellow River and the bridge had been bombed and no longer existed. And she put the kids to bed for the night and then went down by the beach and just broke down in tears. Because even, even great men and women of God have feet of clay, right? <laughs> the, the classic example is Elijah. You know, mocking the prophets of Baal. In the next chapter, he's running for his life from this queen. I mean, a man of great faith and great fear. And here she just broke down under the stress. And one of the little girls, who was a light sleeper, heard her crying and got up and came down to comfort her and put her little arms around her, a little eight-year-old girl. And Gladys said, it's no use. It's no use. We're not going to make it. And the little girl, full of faith, reminded her of one of the stories that she had told her and the other orphans about Moses and the children of Israel at the Red Sea and the Egyptians are closing in and God made a way. And Gladys was probably thinking, why the heck did I tell him that story? <laughs> <laughs> and she said, she said to the little girl, she said, well, honey, I'm no Moses. And the little girl said, but God is still God. <laughs> yeah. And Gladys Aylward later on in an interview, she said this. And I, in my estimation, she's one of the great heroes of the 20th century. But for her, she felt like God told her that he had chosen, originally called a man to do that job. Because it was a dangerous thing to go to China as a single woman. She said, God chose a man 
But he said no. And then God looked down and said, well, there's Gladys. At least she's willing. Let's use her. <laughs> and that's what God asks. How many of us here can say, I'm one of the weak and the foolish? I feel like I don't have what it takes, but I'm willing, Lord. If that's you, would you stand? I just want to pray for you. Bill, could you just lead us in a concluding song? But specifically, if you would say to the Lord, God, I'm one of those. I feel, I feel unprepared. I feel incapable, but I'm willing. I'm willing, Lord. Lord, I pray for myself because I'm standing too. And all of us, we say, Lord, would you come and pour out your spirit on our nation again, on this city again? Lord, pull back the veil that people would be able to see you. And God, would you use us? Use us because we're willing. Do what you need to in and through us to demonstrate in the, in the flesh, in real time, your love, the Father's love in and through us to this lost world. For Jesus' sake. Let me be filled with kindness and compassion for the one, the one for whom you loved and gave your son for humanity. Increase my love and help me to love. Like you do, a love that erases all the lines and sees the truth. And oh, that when they look in my eyes, they would see you, even in just a smile, they would feel the Father. sing this again, help me to love with open arms, that we would stand here together with open arms before us, just like this. Um, so if you would, let's just extend our hands like this, because that's how God wants us to approach people, too. Not just to approach him, but to approach people and to be ready to extend his love. And it might be even a literal hug 
that there might be a whole lot more hugging going on in the family of God and a whole lot more declaring of the truth and, and a, just a whole lot more of the, the simple approach to people that when they come away from an encounter with us, they would think there's just something different in that person. And we know who it is. We know it's him. It's, it's not us. It's just him in us. And without him, we just don't have that. So let's say this to God again. Help me to love with open arms like you do. A love that erases all the lines and sees the truth. And oh, that when they look in my eyes, may they see you. Even in just a smile, they would feel the Father's love. So let all my life tell of who you are and the wonder of your never-ending love. And let all my life tell of who you are, that you're wonderful and such a good father, such a good father. Oh, how you love us, Lord from the homeless among us to the famous among us and all of the rest of us in between that, Lord. How perfect is your love and thank you that you formed us carefully and you made us for yourself. So, Lord, we would respond to you this morning or this afternoon and surrender our life to you. And I want to ask anybody that's ready to make a fresh surrender of your life to Jesus. And maybe you've never surrendered. It really struck me in the second service that there are people all over Orange County who went down to check out the tent in 1971 and 72. <laughs> and they thought, oh, this is nonsense. This is not for me. These people have lost their mind. And they missed Jesus and they walked away and they're all over the place. And maybe some are in here right now. And I'll tell you, if you could have put your life together on your own, you would have done it by now. And Jesus is here to put the broken pieces of your life together and to pour in what's been missing all along, which is just Jesus, who suffered and died to carry your burdens and your sorrows and your sins to the cross so you could be free of that excruciating weight. And right now is the time to say, Jesus, I'm, I'm done running. Thank you for running after me, but I'm done running from you and I'm surrendering. If that's you... I just want to ask you right now to join me in this prayer and anyone else that's ready just to make a fresh surrender. Let's say this to God. Father in heaven, thank you for sending Jesus who suffered for my sins and my burdens and my sorrows and rose from the dead. And thank you for sending the Holy Spirit to make this truth alive in me. I surrender my life to you, Lord. Forgive me for running from you. I now run to you. Take what's left of my life and make me the person you designed me to be. The rest of my life is yours. In Jesus' strong name, amen. Amen. And one last thing. You are worthy of it all. You are worthy of it all for from you are all things and to you are all things you deserve the glory shift our voices like a little bit of a thunder here one more time before we head out you are worthy you are worthy of it all your people, Lord, as we linger for a while with each other and then as we go on about our days and we're yours, Lord.
We're yours. Do what you want with us. In the strong name of Jesus, amen. Amen. And uh, prayer team's going to be up here. would love to pray with you. Peter, thank you for pouring out upon us today. You want to say thanks to, to Peter? Thank you, brother. And, um, and the prayer room, you can have communion in the prayer room if you like. And the prayer team's going to be here. And the joy boxes are there for your, your offering on your way out. God bless you. This has been a presentation of Refuge Calvary Chapel Huntington Beach. For more information about our ministry, please visit refugefamily.com or call 714-891-9495.